Hey everybody, Kent Walski here checking in with another one of our hashtag Star Trek Discovery episode review shows. Today we're going to be talking about episodes 3 and 4 titled Context is for Kings and The Butcher's Knife Cares Not for the Lamb's Cry. Uh, we're going to go ahead and try to do a quick 15-30 second review of both episodes and then we'll talk about the things that I really liked and really didn't like and every single one of them. Okay, so first off we jump straight into Context for Kings and we take place six months after the events of the pilot episode where Michael Burr Burnham is in fact in jail uh, and on her way to a prison facility for her crimes of mutiny. They get picked up by the USS Discovery and there she meets up with Captain Lorca who decides that he needs her assistance in helping out with some top secret um, specialized project that is going to help win the war for the Federation against the Klingons that has been raging on for the past six months. On board we get to see a fancy looking black badge which is reminiscent of potentially section 31. We get to meet a brand new character known as Commander Landry and Cadet Tilly, and we also get to meet up with our everyone's favorite openly gay character played by Anthony Rapp, whose name I can't remember, so he's just, he's just Lieutenant Anthony Rapp, that's his name, he's Anthony Rapp. And uh, so while they're on board the ship, uh, she's put to work and is forced to then kind of discover what it is that Discovery is kind of doing out in deep space. She also gets to do a little bit of a reconciliation with Saru, you guys may remember him, he's the guy with the creepy gangula, and he freaks out every time that there's, uh, you know, death nearby. So they have a bit of a reconciliation piece in this episode because he thinks that after in a few days, um, that she's going to be on her way continuing on to the prison colony. During the events of the episode, it is revealed that the Discovery actually has a sister ship known as the USS Glenn. Both of these ships are testing out some kind of experimental technology, uh, and apparently it's pretty high-tech and it's pretty high-dangerous stuff, and apparently there's some kind of accident on board the Glen, which turns everyone into, you know, basically inside-out monsters. While on board of that ship, we get our first ground action sequence that we haven't had since the second episode and we get to see some cool phaser weapons in use and we have a little bit of a horror aspect limited into the show which i thought was kind of cool as well now while on the glen we encounter a brand new creature known as lil ripper and he is essentially ripping up klingons and federation uh people at the, with the like and it is later revealed that he is a consequence of the technology that the discovery and the uss glen are using in order to win the war with the federation michael burnham feels as though it's going to be some kind of weird genetic weapon that's going to be used, some biological technical weapon that's going to be used to wipe out the Klingons. And then Captain Lorca, at the end of this episode, reveals to her that it, in fact, is not a weapon as so much it is a new way to quote-unquote fly and that they're using these things called spores these you know harmless little spores in order to connect to a web of information all around the known universe that they can zip around with at the at the, at the spore speed faster than any warp speed available and that they can be anywhere in an instant and uh even places that they haven't been before because i guess these spores remember things about where they've been and you can access them anyways they haven't really perfected the technology and obviously it's pretty dangerous because everyone on the glen turned into inside out monsters and that's pretty creepy. So that ends context is for kings. All right, now the butcher episode is also pretty interesting. We start off the episode with a distress call from a dilithium facility that produces 40% of all the dilithium for the Federation fleet, and the USS Discovery is the only ship that can, of course, reach there in time because of their super cool spore drive, which they haven't really tested out yet. They have not been able to master it. Anthony Rapp's character is still can't quite get the long extended jumps uh, from where they are around the different quadrants in order to get to a final destination. Uh, they go ahead and press the situation anyways and try to just get it done and they wind up almost crashing into his son. The sensors indicate external temperature of they went offline. Which is pretty humorous for that particular moment because Anthony Rapp's nose breaks and they have to fix it and he almost looks like a damned Tellarite. And we also get the opportunity for Michael Burnham to, instead of working on the spore drive, which is what Captain Lorca promised her in the previous episode, to go ahead and try to weaponize Little Ripper, which you guys may remember from the previous episode, that was murdering everybody on the USS Glenn. Apparently Lorca's got like a weird fetish for weapons. I don't know. Her and Commander Landry are working together to try to weaponize all the different aspects of Little Ripper, as they so affectionately call him. But... Michael Burnham is attempting to try to understand the creature on a more, you know, personal level. Um, but Commander Landry doesn't agree with her methods, and she she goes ahead and tries to press the situation by unlocking the creature's cage and trying to cut off one of its claws for study. That, of course, ends badly, and we lose the Com Commander Landry. You will be sorely missed. In the arms of the angel. 
After that, it is later discovered by Michael Burnham that the creature itself responds to the spore drive once it's activated. So she uses this information to try to figure out that this creature has some kind of connection to it. Fast forward through a bunch of science gobbly gook later, it turns out that this particular creature also has the ability to direct and modify where the spores send the ship. So they hook it up to some what appears to be some painful ass futuristic BDSM technology down in the engineering bay, and then they are able to easily zip around the galaxy. It does hurt the creature, which apparently uh, affects Michael Burnham on a personal level. Uh, so she seems to be regretful about that, but the ship is able to get to the colony in time to destroy the Klingons and save the Dilithium Mine itself and all, most of the people that are still living there. Overall, this is a pretty good episode, and also uh, Michelle Yeo's Captain Giorgio's uh, Last Will and Testament arrives and totally guilt trips Michael Burnham into feeling even worse about what she did, and she gives her like a telescope or something. I don't know. Whatever. Also, it turns out that the albino Klingon and his buddies have been hanging around the binary star for six months because they couldn't fix their shit ship yet. And later on, uh, one of the other Klingon guys from the first episode shows up and basically steals his ship and he's left stranded with his uh, non-albino girlfriend. Okay, so that wraps up the super fast, that was much longer than 15 to 30 seconds, super fast review of both episodes. Um, I must say, we're going to talk about a few different things here specifically, but I must say that episode three for me so far has felt like a really, really good episode of television. And it actually felt more like Trek than anything we've seen so far from Discovery. I know a lot of people dogged on episodes one and two, including myself. I, I think I was a little bit more lenient than other folks, but um, I, I, I did think it was pretty good. But episode three for me, Context is for Kings, really stepped it up. The writing felt a lot better. The dialogue was much, much smoother. The character motivations were better. All of the new characters that they introduced um, were so much, so much better than what we have experienced so far. So Rue's background um, antics in these two episodes were much better as opposed to him being kind of a potential primary character. Uh, now he's kind of seconded to what appears to be Tilly and Anthony Rapp and Commander Lorca, along with Michael Burnham. And uh, these folks, you know, the three new characters that we've gotten, I don't count Commander Landry anymore because she's dead, um, but the three new characters that we've gotten off of the USS Discovery so far have such large personalities that they just really revitalized the show for me. So I do want to go ahead and say before we get into individual reviews of certain things that if you were on the fence about the show after the first two episodes, definitely be sure to check out episode three. I think it's a kind of a game changer for the show, and episode four was very good, but uh, to me, episode three so far has been the top episode um, of this season. So hopefully we continue to kind of upswing and, and get better as, as the seasons go on. Okay, so the first thing I want to go ahead and talk about is the potential for the USS Discovery to be part of section 31. Um, you know, this isn't uh, this isn't exactly uh, uh, you know a surprise. I, I think that a lot of fans were kind of assuming that there'd be some Section Thirty One involvement with the USS Discovery because mainly because we have never heard of anything with the show the ship did, or even the ship itself. So it's possible that Section Thirty One has classified the mission, the ship, all the personnel, and basically everything that ever happened to it, and that's why we've never heard about it in other Star Trek episodes or movies. Um, but they went full on uh, teaser here where they had this black badged individual guarding a door, um, which is not typical of Section 31. They're much more CIA clandestine, but those guys do love black and they really love black leather. So it makes sense that the badge itself was black and that was most likely Section 31. I really hope that they're not going to be including another clandestine organization. It would really just make no sense for them to add another one. Just keep it Section 31, just kind of retweak their MO perhaps during uh, during the Klingon War. Maybe they're being a little bit more direct as opposed to clandestine. Um, or maybe it's even possible that during this time, Section 31 is a bit more of an official part of the branch, and maybe they do something perhaps in this show that causes them to go back underground again and operate on the fringes of Federation you know, uh, authority and stuff like that. So I'm curious to see where they go with that. It was definitely a nice Easter egg. They obviously pointed it out very specifically in the show. So they haven't touched on it in episode four. So hopefully it comes back up in this season. They don't just leave us teased up until season two. The next thing I want to talk about is the spore drive. Now, this is a piece of technology that no one's ever heard of, um, and they're implying, based off of the technology gobbledygook that's in the episode, that these spores have been all over the universe, and they have the ability to access 
the, I guess, the memory, the avenues that these spores use to get there to these different locations throughout all of the known universe in an instant. And they could be from, and they show in the show, like, to Romulus, to Vulcan, to the moons of Andoria, to everywhere um, in an instant and, and back home again without even realizing that you've been gone. Uh, so they eventually master this technology with the help of the Little Ripper character. Um, and that character is able to somehow magically interface with the computer. And then they're able to plot a, a course that gets them to Corvan 2. And, and they're able to save the day for the Dilithium colony. Um, no one, of course, has ever heard of the Spore Drive. Initially, I thought they were going to be talking about... Because they were talking about like conduits and the web that connects everything together. So I thought they were going to be talking about transwarp conduits. But then they totally changed it up and went with this Spore Drive technology. So I don't know what's going to happen here. I'm wondering if it's just going to be banned um, or if uh, Michael Burnham, because she felt really guilty about the creature uh, being tortured through the devices. I'm wondering if she's going to do something that causes the creature to either die or escape and then they lose, you know, the, the ability to use the spore drive. So therefore, um, you know, that's a non-viable technology, which is why we never heard of it. Or what would be really interesting if Section 31 takes the technology at the end of the show and then uses it to explore parts of unknown space that even yet we have even been able to see um, in the show. So they may go way off the cuff here and do something completely different with it. But as of right now, it's completely outside of canon, but uh, I don't hate it. But I'm curious to see what they're going to do with it um, in the future. Next up I want to talk about is Captain Lorca. Oh, Jesus. You know, Jason Isaac, he's just, whoo, he's killing it. He's killing it. He's, uh, you know, he just embodies the character. I love it. Uh, you know, his character is so great. Um, and really breathed, bre you know, and really breathed life into the show. I felt like the first two episodes kind of was a letdown for a lot of fans, but his character has so much personality and he's very interesting. He's very mysterious. And you feel like you can trust him, but at the same time, you feel like you can't trust him. And I think that's kind of a great aspect of Jason Isaac's acting. Um, because even at the end of Context is for Kings, he's like, listen, Michael, I'm not here to make have you make weapons for me. I want you to help me come up with a new way to fly so we can win the war and help, help end this conflict. And then literally in the next episode, right at the beginning, Act 1, He's like, no, forget the fucking spore drive. I need you to weaponize this creature that we beamed up from the USS Glenn that you guys ran into. Um, so, you know, I don't know. I don't consider that to be bad writing. I don't consider that to be an inconsistent character. I'm thinking that we're learning more about both Michael's character and Lorca's character. Uh, that Lorca's kind of a, kind of a, you know, kind of a manipulator. And Michael, who signed up for, you know, finding a new way to fly but is way more interested in discovering and you know exploring her curiosity about this creature. I think we learned quite a bit about the two different characters. Michael didn't seem too upset that she was being asked to work on a weapon, even though before in the episode of Context is for King, she was kind of standing on a moral high ground. But I feel like Lorca kind of understands her and is milking her a little bit and massaging her out. Milking her sounds really weird, by the way. Kind of massaging her character out and being like, listen, you may pretend like you're on board with the Federation ideals, but I know deep down that this is something that you're really interested in and getting this, you know, basically doing whatever needs to be done in order to ensure the victory of the Federation is, is what you're all about. And honestly, that's what Section 31 is all about. So um, it, it makes sense that she's a part of this crew. And I think, like I said, I think we've based off of those two very subtle actions of sitting there saying, you know, I want you to be here to help me fix, you know, the, the spore drive and then immediately jumping to, I need you to make these weapons and her being on board with it, essentially. Um, I feel as though, you know, we're learning a lot about both of those characters. Um, and Lorca, I feel like, has is, is got so much more going on that we're not aware of as, as viewers yet. So I'm curious to see how they start to unravel uh, his mysterious background and what it is that made him this master of war and why it is he feels the way he does about uh, basically just and the ends justifying the means, um, which again is essentially the mantra of Section 31. So I, I, if he's not part of Section 31 yet, I think that he will most likely uh, will be at some point in the future and most likely Michael potentially will go with him um, on that particular adventure. So I'm curious to see how that particular thing plays out. And finally, I want to go ahead and touch on um, kind of a subplot that's going on right now, which is the Klingon romance between Albino Boy and his girlfriend, non-Albino woman. Um, I don't remember their names. The only Klingon's name I remember right now is Takavma. That's the only one I remember. Uh, and he's the dead one, so it's not really helpful. But uh, 
Anyways, in the episodes, they obviously lose their ship to uh, Cole of House Core. He steals their shit, um, and they're kind of stranded on the Shenzhou together, and they basically are like, well, we have a little raider, and we're going to go kind of get you up to snuff and how to be a leader, and then we're going to try to uh, avenge you know, House Tecovma and, and all that bullshit. Um, there is a romance subplot going on between the two of them. I don't know how much they're going to explore um, with that. I think it would be kind of fun to see what happens between the two characters um because we don't really have any other romances going on on screen yet so it'd be interesting to see if they do a klingon romance before they do a human romance um so that'd be kind of fun that'd be a different uh, unique take on things so i'm curious to see how that unfolds you know that's something that's definitely kind of intriguing me on a lot of levels so we'll see what's up with that anyways uh my overall ratings for both the episodes of uh, a scale of one to ten one being uh really really bad and ten being mind-blowing i would say that context is for kings is closer to an 8.5 8.9 for me and uh the butcher's knife is probably a solid 7.8 for me um again like i said at the beginning if you're on the fence about watching the episodes three and four because you watch the first two episodes please 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 spend the hour and you know 30 minutes or whatever it's going to be of your life watch the next two episodes and then make a determination after that i feel like it's a completely different show and i kind of wish we had started this show off with episode two or excuse me episode three context is for kings and then they intercut what happened at the battle of the binary stars and the mutiny actions later on through flashbacks and later revealed it um i think it would have been more fun for us to be part of the viewing audience coming into michael burnham's character as an individual that appears to be really smart and really dedicated to the federation but is on the block chopping block as a mutineer and a warmonger so it's interesting it would have been more interesting i feel like if we had been able to experience that mystery as opposed to just getting all the information out later uh, immediately right off the bat um i feel like if they had released it later on through flashback sequences we would have probably been more sympathetic because then it would have been a situation where it's like well we know where's this mutineer warmonger but we're not quite sure and then if they came out later that she was essentially just trying to protect her crew and her captain you would feel very sympathetic to that and you would feel like very sad to her for her and in, in a situation where you'd be like man you know she was just trying to do the right thing but now everybody just views her in this negative light and i feel like we as an audience would have been more sympathetic uh to that situation um but anyways too late for that now they already did what they did so but like i said i would definitely go check out episodes three and four they're pretty good so i'm also really curious to hear what you guys and gals thought of episodes three and four what do you think about captain Lorca? do you think he's a mysterious character uh do you like the addition of him in there uh what do you did you think about the fact that we lost commander landry so quickly i was genuinely surprised by that particular turn of events didn't think she was gonna die i thought she was gonna get fucked up for sure but i didn't think she was gonna die i thought maybe michael was gonna kill her later on in the season for some other reason um, and I'm also curious to hear what you guys think about the inclusion of the Spore Drive and Slash Section 31 um, and this whole mysterious USS Discovery stuff going on. Do you think the Black Badge was Section 31 and do you think that they control the Spore Drive, which is why we've never heard of it? Or do you think that the Spore Drive will just disappear and Section 31 will continue on their mission and do different other things? Uh, I'm really curious to hear what all of you guys and gals think about these two episodes. Anyways, guys and gals, that wraps up my Episodes 3 and 4 review for Star Trek Discovery. Uh, if you enjoyed this video, please throw a like and a subscribe up on YouTube um, so that you can stay up to date with more Star Trek Discovery discussion videos, lores, and let's plays of Star Trek online. And follow me on Twitter at RealCatWalski and I will see all of you guys and gals next time. Live long and prosper, my trickies!